Hi, everybody. It's Jim Stein from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. And it's really a pleasure to be here today with Professor Daryl Francis from Imperial College of London. And for the next several minutes, we're going to be talking about the Samson trial, which uh, his group will be presenting at the American Heart Association meetings and simultaneously publishing in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's an N of one trial of a statin placebo or no treatment to assess side effects. Good morning, Daryl. Good morning. Great it's to be really on board. It's great to be here with you uh, this morning. I'm sure everyone is eagerly waiting to hear from you. Uh, those of us that only get to hear you on Twitter are really excited to see you almost in person today. <laughs> so I'm much more beautiful in real life than it appears on here, which oh, is why can... the presenter at the AHA, is, because it doesn't always come across in, on the camera how attractive I am. So we're sending someone else to actually present. I can feel the glow already yeah, from this. That's, that's right. <laughs> so, so Daryl, before we even jump into what you showed, let's just talk a little bit about why you did this study. Why did we need Samson? Wasn't the ASCOT study enough? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so we have loads of data for most sensible people to recognize that uh, statins really slash the event rate of cardiovascular disease. So strokes and heart attacks, you can halve them through statins. And since these are still the number one cause of disease worldwide, so I used to like argue when I, in medical school, we were told that, oh, you can study atheroma, that doesn't really matter because it's only sort of uh, developed countries that have them. Around the world, it's malaria and schistosomiasis that really kill people. And so I carried that through. And it was actually only when I was a consultant, believe it or not, when a registrar told me that cardiovascular is the number one killer, I said, oh, no, you're fine. If you look, it's malaria and stuff for some other. Yeah. And then they looked and they said, no, it's not. So all of that seems to have reduced. And instead, the people in the developing world are also like stuffing their faces and smoking away and uh, getting the same thing people are getting in the developed countries. So it's the number one cause of death. And unlike things like cancer, um, which is like the number two, and uh, is very difficult to prevent other than not smoking, all the other things you want to do to try and not get cancer are really hard. Statins are really effective. But uh, half of the people that start a statin stop it within one or two years, just over half. And the number one cause of that documented is uh, side effects when they take the tablets. And then you can go to them and say, look, here is ASCOT, SHMASCOT, whatever, you know, all of these things. Then look, there's no sign, it's the same in the two arms. And they go, yeah, you give me like 10,000 people, 10,000 other bloody people. I don't care about those people, I care about me. They're not the ones getting what I'm getting. And there is no answer to that because in a world where uh, we are looking to be personalized, that RCT, um, is kind of at the wrong extreme. The more people we put into a trial, the more impressive you and I, or impressed you and I are, that the result is, is correct on average. But we are happy to work with averages. But when you are experiencing a side effect, you really want to know for yourself what, what's actually going on. And that's why we designed Samson. The idea of Samson was for an individual person who's had to give up statins, um, permanently because of side effects when they take it, they could find out um, uh, whether the side effects are really a biochemical result of the, uh, of the statin. Oh, that's great. I really like the way you characterize that because you, know, you and I like numbers, we're, 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 we're medical scientists, we like mm -hmm. to talk about averages, but on the flip side, when we talk to patients, especially when, for example, they're feeling nihilistic about their outcomes and we're trying to give them hope we do the reverse and we say, remember, the only statistic that matters is you and your outcome and, and don't yeah. look at the bad odds. Yeah. Yet when it comes to side effects, we, we, we totally flip it and focus on the negative. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, Daryl, yeah, I've been on a statin for a, a, a little while and last, last uh, spring after spending the winter eating too much and laying on my couch watching Netflix, I went out and bicycled and I couldn't get up a hill and I ached all over. And I thought, holy crap, I've got statin myopathy. <laughs> and you didn't think it was Netflix mediated uh, muscle ink. <laughs> well, you know, that was my hypothesis. After I went through the study of stopping my medication without telling my doctor 
because I've only told my patients so many times yeah. not to do that. <laughs> um, so let, let's before we jump into what an N of one study is, how often do you have a discussion with your patients about muscle aches and try to convince them that the muscle aches aren't real or that they should be on a statin? And, and what do you tell them? Yeah. So uh, what I try to do, if I have enough time, I explain what the placebo control trials show that there are symptoms in both, uh, in, when people take statins, they do get symptoms uh, on the statins, but it's exactly the same on the placebo. Okay. And that satisfies most people. Um, but that, that because I sit and bring out, you know, load up the trials and show, show them and they think about it and they have time. Most doctors don't have that time. And, uh, it's, and then they do something which I think is actually a very bad thing and we can discuss later why I think it's a bad thing. They say, all right, we'll take a smaller dose oh, right. or <laughs> take it alternate days or, you know, put it on a bit of string and just lick it for a bit, let's swallow it and then pull it out, you know, whatever it is we do. <laughs> but I think all that is doing is reinforcing whatever it is that's making us feel apprehensive about it. So um, the reason for the, uh, the trial was to give something that we could do that both the doctor and the patient could see was a useful way of finding out for certain. Because if you are, the, the problem with just stopping the tablet is, when do you stop the tablet? You stop the tablet when you have a lot of symptoms. And then when do you restart it? Well, you're not gonna restart it the next day when you still have lots of symptoms, that would be crazy. So you wait until the symptoms go, and then you restart it, yeah? But as a result, you're guaranteed to get worse when you restart it and better when you stop it. And the more often you repeat that cycle, the more reinforce. convincing the observational data is, uh, we well, call it an interventional data, but it doesn't have a randomized start time. And it makes sense because why would anyone actually randomize the start time? But if you have to, if you don't want to accidentally misunderstand um, random background variation as though it's a tablet effect. But as you'll see in Samson, uh, obviously by having a protocol, we eliminate that because they start and stop. But there's, a, there's other problems which Samson will answer as well. So that's great. Let's just jump right into the Samson trial. If you could tell me a little bit about the design first, and then we can go into the results. Yeah. So in Samson, we were really interested in these patients who uh, had, had, to, had, had such bad side effects on statin tablets that they had to give them up completely. So we only wanted people who had proper severe side effects so bad that they had stopped stat, uh, the statin tablets. If they were still struggling along, to one, in one regard, it, maybe it wasn't so bad. And also maybe it wouldn't be bad enough to show up in the trial because that's the other worry we have. So we only wanted people who had permanently stopped statins clinically because of side effects. So we got patients who had done that, who'd stopped because of side effects and, um, the 60 patients in the trial were each given uh, a box of 12 medication bottles. Four of the bottles contained statin tablets. It was a Torvastatin 20, which is the standard dose we use in the UK. Four of the bottles contained placebo, and these were manufactured placebo to look the same. So even if you break it up, it looks the same. But four of the bottles were completely empty. And so in those months, you know you're not taking a medication. And patients took these uh, 12 bottles in the 12 months in a random order that was pre-specified for them. And then every day during the year, they could report symptoms using a smartphone app. And the way we, we documented symptoms is we wanted to be as little annoying as possible. You know how much I like not to be annoying. And uh, well, for patients, I really do like to be, you know, I don't mind annoying scientists, but you know, <laughs> these are people who are volunteering to take a, pay, a tablet that uh, causes really bad symptoms. So you wanna make life easy. So whatever it was that symptom that made you stop, you score how badly you felt on that scale from zero to hundred. So it could be muscle ache, but it could be anything else. Um, and you report it daily. And then at the end, this is what we're expecting. Once we rearrange the months, we were expecting to see the no treatment month, this is like a made up data set that we actually put in our grant um, application. So we're expecting the no treatment months to be uh, fairly low scoring. 
and then the statin months to be high scoring. Um, and then the big question is, where is the placebo months going to be? Are they going to be uh, like the statin, in which case it is a, uh, that patient is getting mainly a um, nocebo effect, psychological trauma from the, from the tablet? Or is it like the no treatment effect, in which case that is like a, um, uh, that, that, that is telling you that, it, that the effect is entirely biochemically due to the statin. So we're expecting this middle group to be somewhere in the middle, the statin, uh, the placebo group to be in the middle. And then we could calculate what I wanted to call the nocebo ratio, which is how big is the uh, placebo effect as measured above the background no treatment level compared with the, um, the statin, statin effect. So we wanted to know how big this black was as a proportion of this black plus uh, crosshatched. Uh, the other thing we want to know is, does doing all of this make a difference to whether you go back onto a clinical statin or not? And so the second endpoint was to measure the percentage of people taking statins at six months after completing the trial. So, Daryl, thanks for showing me the design. I, I really like the design. I have two questions about it, though. I'm used to going to the heart meeting and seeing a study with 25,000 people. How in the world can you show anything with 60 people? I mean, like confidence intervals, they're, they're wide. And, and if you square root them, they're still like wide. And, <laughs> and it's too small. And I learned that from you. So no, no, are yes. you a little crazy? Absolutely. Here? Well, we're a bit sad in cardiology in that we have lost interest in experimental design. You could argue we've, <laughs> many of us have lost interest in science. And we go along and uh, sit in a, a Congress and every trial has the same endpoint, MACE slightly differently defined to try and make it interesting, but in the end, it is major adverse cardiac events. The problem with that is that, uh, well, uh, there are two problems. Number one problem is that it contributes one binary digit of information per patient. So each patient, the entire, the patient comes in, they take their, the family takes them uh, into the hospital, take days off, go and have tests, go and have their cardiac bypass or angioplasty or whatever, they have all their tests. And in the end, that is summarized down into one binary digit. In fact, less than one binary digit, because if most people have one outcome, like survival, uh, then the, the information content is even less. And worse than that, we are actually quite good. Unfortunately, through how effective these trials have been in the past, we worked out to make people not die and not have heart attacks. Uh, and so the event rates are low. And then the people who sign up to be in trials are not your average patient. They are systematically people who are healthier, um, both on the observed indices, but also when you control for them, when you control for every measured variable in the people who say yes to being in a trial versus people who say no to being in a trial. Even when you match them for that, you find that the trial entrants have a mortality that is about half that of the non-trial entrants, possibly because we don't document whether they trust a doctor, whether they take their medication. Uh, the sorts of person who signs up to trial is someone who believes in all of this medical par paraphernalia we do. So as a result, all of the trials, almost all the trials we see at AHA are measuring MACE and contributing a less than one bit of information for patients. So they have to stack up lots of patients to prove a point. Um, but if we're looking for other types of effect, like for example, does a drug reduce blood pressure? You don't need many patients to prove that a, blood reduce, a drug reduces blood pressure because you're measuring a physiological variable rather than alive or dead where almost everyone is alive. Um, and so that is the reason um, this trial didn't have to be large. In fact, in an N of one trial, you're trying to get an answer for an individual patient. And if you think that's impossible, think about all those people who've stopped taking statin uh, because they are, they are satisfied with the evidence that it's causing them side effects. And they've decided that for themselves on an example of one person. So it must be possible to be convinced. And statistically, that's also the case. So um, the N of one trial benefits from having not just one example of each month, but four. So if you are having flu or COVID or something during one of these um, uh, months, then um, uh, you 
also would have it sort of in the next month and the previous month, which would be a different tablet. And it wouldn't happen on all four of them systematically. So by having it multiple times, you get that advantage. And also, potentially, you can answer every day and get a different score. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's, it's really, a, I, I think it's a brilliant way to approach studying outcomes of interest to individual people rather than diluting the interest to the individual amongst a large number of people that contribute a small amount of information to the final outcome. So let's jump into the results then. Uh, we'll talk about the nocebo ratio, how many people stopped, you know, what they were taking when they stopped, the proportion still oh. taking at six months, et cetera. Fantastic. So here are the results. What you see uh, here is a graph that shows for each of the individual patients, uh, 49 patients out of the 60 completed the entire 12 months. And for each of those 49 patients, you see uh, a dot for each of their months. The red dots are the statin months, the blue dots are the placebo months, and the gray dots are the no tablet months. So you can see it's quite a spread. And what we've ordered these, not in order of patient number, but in order of what their average symptom score was. So there was some people with very little symptoms and some people with lots of symptoms over on the right-hand side. Um, of course, what happened to the 11 that we are hiding from you is the first question you should ask. So we uh, also showed those. Um, and uh, again, it was a kind of mixed pattern. They may have withdrawn for different reasons and we, um, we'll probably cover that in another publication, but sometimes they withdrew because they realized they've been on loads of tablet months and hadn't had much side effects. So it can't be that bad. And so they said, I'd like to go back on a statin. Some of them found everything intolerable and had to give up. Uh, so there was a mixture of reasons for giving up, but here are the all of the data that people, um, for the months that their people did. And then this is what happens when you compose them together. And interestingly, that there is a definitely significantly higher symptom score during the statin months than the no treatment months, but there is also a significantly higher symptom score during placebo than no treatment. And there's no difference between the placebo and the statin arm. Um, the placebo arm is about 90% of the way up to the statin arm. So on that basis, uh, this ratio, which uh, we like to call the nocebo ratio or the nocebo fraction, uh, comes to about 0.9. Uh, and that was the primary result. So what happened six months later uh, when we chased up the patients? What we found was 30 of the 60 were back clinically uh, taking statins. So it a, I know it looks fake as though we just made that up, but actually it really was 30. <laughs> There's a bit of face palming. So, well, you know, we could have made up that number, say it was about half, but actually, you know, it was there. So uh, those are the two key results of, of the study. So what I take from this is two interesting points. The first is that statin tablet side effects are very real. They are reproducibly induced under experimental conditions with daily measurements of symptoms in people who are focused on getting this established beyond doubt. But the second point is, the cause of this is not the statin in the tablet. It is largely driven by the fact that you're taking a tablet. Um, and uh, this is, uh, should create a lot of reflection in our minds because we have all these patients who have um, stopped statins for good because of intolerable side effects. And this trial shows that those side effects are real. And, we think that if we put them back on statins, they would get the side effect, but they would get very similar intensity of side effect if we gave them placebo. <clears throat> How we handle this information is, a, uh, is an indicator of how good, how well we can balance science and medicine. Because somehow we have to explain this to people because it's an aspect that we very little discuss with patients normally, the nocebo effect. So, um, Daryl, let me ask you a couple a couple questions about this, the study first, and then we can spend the rest of our time talking about the implications. The, the, the first has to do with extrapolating from the data. Would it be incorrect to say, and I, you can see I'm setting you up here, <laughs> <laughs> that 10% of muscle aches are due to statins? 
or that the rate of muscle symptoms is 11% higher on statins than on placebo. How is the best way to reflect the results in a scientifically accurate way? Right, so scientifically accurately, so <clears throat> the thing we can say very clearly that in our experiment, we saw um, almost the same level of symptoms in the placebo as we saw in the statin. And as you say, the difference we observed in the trial was about 10%, 10%, 11%. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that 90% uh, of the symptoms uh, are not caused by the, um, uh, the statin, but the tablet, just because people will get offended by that. <laughs> um, because actually, uh, it could be 100%. Uh, but we might not have captured some people, you know, it might be one in a hundred people have really intense side effects, like we thought lots of people would, which di didn't show up on the, um, because, you know, it which didn't show up in the placebo. one. And uh, we didn't see anyone like that, really intense, as you can see from the graphs, uh, but there might be such people. So, uh, except we now have a method of them identifying themselves. If they do this sort of protocol, it will be obvious. And then uh, those people uh, really should be studied at much greater intensity because we need to try and discover what is the cause of that so that we cannot put them through this process uh, and maybe give them other cholesterol lowering alternatives. Um, in terms of, so when I am getting, so if I, so when I take statins, I take statins by the way, when I, take, when, when I first started taking statins, um, I used to get tummy rumbling. Um, so the first time I took it, I got tummy rumbling, didn't think anything of it, then ran out and then restarted once I got a new supply and got tummy rumbling again. So I said, ah, interestingly, my symptom is tummy rumbling. And each time I take the statin, I remember telling my mother this, um, uh, and I get it for a few days and then it goes away. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just keep taking it and I'll be fine. And so that worked until the next time I ran out uh, and restarted and nothing happened. And then I realized what I'd done is put two and two together and made 10. Um, and a problem we face with statins is that they are given to people who are generally fit and healthy. They go to the doctor for one thing and then get forced to take some tablet for a condition which they don't agree with them having uh, for life, apparently. Um, and uh, since it happens to people as they get older, as you get older, one accumulates more symptoms. When you're 20, you have no symptoms. As you get older, you gain symptoms. Um, so uh, when you're looking to associate symptoms with a cause, this is a brilliant cause. Uh, that's one problem. Second problem is it is the tablet that's most universally prescribed. And that has a very important impact because if I go and complain to a newspaper that cyclosporin A is causing, you know, baldness, according to lose my hair. Um, they won't be that interested because they say, well, not many people are on cyclist for an A. So, you know, they don't care. So what tablet is going to be at the top of the list to write newspaper articles? It's going to be statins. And uh, so I think that's why side effects of statins have uh, become promoted up the press. It's a kind of uh, it's one of these sequences of repeated things. Once it's reported, other people report it, and other people report it, and it can't be counteracted. There's no real life experience that can say um, uh, that actually it's not. So uh, we've been trapped, unfortunately, with statins. Yeah, as I oftentimes tell my patients, human beings are, are cause and effect machines. We, we've survived for tens of thousands of years by making correlations between our symptom and what we ate, what we did, what we took, and, and very often we're wrong. But you know, Daryl, yeah, like when, when you're looking out of your cave and you see the grass wiggling, you know, you could say, well, that could be random wiggling or it could be a lion coming to eat me. Uh, the people who always say it could be random because they're statistically minded and they do the Bayes theorem, they will get eaten. And so we, we, are, the, we are the offspring <laughs> of the people that always suspected it was a liar. That's right. uh, and uh, that, that's the reason that we think that way, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the bias really had a survival benefit in that situation. 
but, but what really occurs to me here is that the symptoms are real. You know, oftentimes in medicine, we knowledgeable scientists, physicians think patients are crazy. No. Yet the symptoms here are real, which makes me wonder whether or not we are doing harm to people when we prescribe statins to people who are otherwise well. Now, I'm, of course, a strong statin advocate. Mm. I run a preventive cardiology clinic. Mm. I do a lot of primary prevention. But am I taking a person and turning them into a patient when I give them a medication to prevent some to statistically prevent something in the future, yet also am statistically causing a symptom in the near run? Definitely you are. And you are a bad person and you should feel ashamed. And part of it is when we sit and explain to them about side effects and say, well, people report side effects, but you know, it's probably not real. If I was a patient, I would say, I would interpret that as, as their side effects, but they're probably mild, which then allows the side effects to arise and then allows them to diagnose that it's not mild in them. I ask you this, so people who've had, um, uh, people you start in your prevention clinic on a statin after sort of elaborate discussions about pros and cons and everything, then go away to say, right, I feel completely normal. I'm preventing something that might happen in the future. Uh, but actually, I don't, you know, I eat healthily and I walk around healthily, just like the people who come in with heart attacks, but never mind. Yeah, I, I live a healthy life. Nobody thinks they live an unhealthy life. Um, and I'm being asked to start something and I've been given some chit chat about possible side effects. Now they're putting themselves in a position where they are ripe to induce side effects uh, on them. Um, and we've done that because when someone comes in and we put, uh, they come in for with a myocardial infarction, uh, they get wheeled in, you know, got pain, and they say, right, um, we do a, a detailed history and examination. You've got pain, yeah, what time to start? Yeah, okay, sign here if you want to live, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then, then they say, oh, so, what's this? so well, it's a stand, we're gonna put a bit of uh, metal up, you know, it could kill you, but it probably won't. It's better to have it than not. And, you know, it's generally a good thing. They go, all right, I'll sign here, and then they go and have it done, yeah. No discussion of medication, yeah? because at that time, the junior doctor is busy writing aspirin, clopidogrel, atorvastatin, some sort of ARB, and beta. they're all being written so that the drug chart is now already filled. So they need to get another bit of cardboard if they actually, if they want to have something else, you know, on the days when it was on paper, that was it. A patient arriving in the primary angioplasty would get a regular medication, entire drug chart filled in, and they would need another drug chart if they actually needed any drugs for their own symptomatic benefit. And those guys never have a chit chat about side effect of statins. They're just given it along with the aspirin and clopidogrel and everything, stamp, stamp on their passport and they have it. They're not the ones who come back with the side effects. The ones who come back are the ones who are on no tablets and who get started on one tablet after a detailed discussions of the pros and cons and have their entire focus on that tablet, thinking about what could happen and stuff happens. Um, so um, I think it is a problem and uh, it is that we are inducing it because we are told to discuss side effects with them, yeah, which is like the awesome. craziest thing you could possibly do in an <laughs> unblinded situation. If it was blinded, if they were joining Samson, it'll be fine. But because you're doing it in a way that can only induce side effects, it can't alleviate them. It can only make them feel worse. Uh, that is a mistake. Yeah. And, 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 and to wit, I've never found that any of the, in the rare cases where I prescribe statins to children, teens, and young adults, they also don't get side effects. So yeah. it's this, this kind they, they probably don't listen to what you say about, you know, they, they, they don't whatever. listen. They don't have any symptoms anyways. <laughs> they don't really care. Um, but let, let's talk about how this is actionable clinically. I, I've always found that the best treatment for a nocebo is, is placebo, but, it, but it's the interpersonal placebo. It's yeah. the reassurance. Um, and and it's, it's starting where your patient is, the first rule of social work. So how can N of one data help a doctor in the office if the doctor is going to take this information and use it as another paper? You know, if, if they so, take your paper and throw it down, is that going to make a difference? Or do uh, we need no. to do an N of one with each individual patient? I would like a future in which we do an N of one in uh, individual patients. Because, I mean, the alternative is, say, uh, okay, well, we can't do that and what we're going to do is like start jabbing them with these things which are like, I don't know what how much they cost like hundred thousand dollars a year or something like that you know sell <laughs> your house sell that. your Hold wife <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, so 
if we're willing to pay that amount of money, we're willing to pay something uh, for the Francis box. Uh, I'd love to patent it, but you know, unfortunately, uh, not that I'm a communist or anything, but I wasn't quick enough to, uh, to patent the, the <laughs> idea of 12 little tablets, uh, 12, 12 little uh, boxes inside a box. Um, ideally, why can't we give them a little suitcase and a little randomization chart and say, right, get lost now, stop whinging, come back in a year's time, do not call. Any side effects you have, I don't care, just put them on the app and tell us in a year's time. Patient is happy, doctor is happy, and when they come back, they have uh, data which they can look at for themselves. Because and the other thing I'd like to do is actually allow a patient to say, yes, I agree with you that the trials show that this reduces cardiovascular events, but I, I'm not impressed enough and I don't want to bother. Yeah. And we should let them say, yeah, that's fine. It's absolutely fine. They don't have okay. to synthesize because the moment we often don't um, give people an option. Uh, we kind of say, this is good for you and you should take it. And the only way, you know, what can they say? Get lost and like prong you in the eye, yeah? But, <laughs> but then that messes up the doctor. Then they might need you for an actual disease that they feel they have next time. And uh, they've now messed up their relationship with you. Um, so it's not socially acceptable, people feel, to say, no, I don't want to take it. So when things happen, uh, this is the kind of thing that, encourages people to big up. And once you start to big it up in your mind, then it bigs itself up without you doing anything. Um, so I think the, um, uh, I, I think it's a very difficult challenge, but one step would be to say, if you don't want to be on a statin, absolutely fine. Um, you don't have to be on it and it's no problem for me. If you've thought about it and you think the, uh, the benefits aren't enough uh, to make it worth your while bothering to take a tablet, Fine. But for example, you would probably tell me, go to the gym and exercise once a week, yeah? And I'd say, nah, can't be bothered. It's too lazy, it's too much effort, yeah? I've actually got a treadmill in my flat. My girlfriend made me buy a treadmill in my flat, which I don't use. She uses it now, I don't use it. <laughs> uh, because I'm too lazy, yeah? But I don't have to pretend that I'm allergic to treadmills or like, you know, gyms make me, uh, make me lose my hair or get dandruff or something. I just say, I don't want to do it. And that's the end of the conversation, you know. Um, so we need to give an exit route to people from uh, taking regular medication of any kind, which just says, I agree. They sign up to say, yes, I accept that it's a higher cardiovascular risk, but that, that's, that's what I want to have. Um, and I think we, uh, so, so we're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble because through being touchy feely, thinking that everyone who is exposed to the information about statins would think like you and me that it's definitely worth taking. So anyone who comes up with a reason not to take it, we try and neutralize that reason. Uh, whereas actually that may not be the right thing to do. You're just painting them into a corner. But these patients were not that. These patients genuinely, if they thought that they were like hamming up some side effect that was quite mild, they wouldn't sign up for this trial. So these people really were suffering and we showed that it reproduced. Yeah. I mean, two thirds of your patients have been on two or more statins. Uh, yeah. So that these, these were the, the, the truly statin intolerant patients. Yeah. Have you given any thought to, um, in, a, in a physician practice setting, how many months of this type of design would give enough data for a physician and a patient to be convinced by data if the patient is amenable to being convinced by data? Yeah, and or just exploring for themselves. I mean, they might be, sure. uh, because they, they go through a phase, don't they, where they're not sure until what point they, sh they become sure. Uh, at the point where they're suspicious, that's the point to get in early. By the time they've adopted the view that this is definitely sure, they've only got to that point because they've accumulated sufficient evidence, but it's the wrong kind of evidence. It's unblinded. So without yes. a protocol and without a placebo arm, they're getting the wrong information. So I would get in early with something like this as soon as they're suspicious, or maybe start everyone on this. Okay. Um, how long it would take will partly depend on how long it takes the symptom to arise. So we wanted the trial to last only a finite amount of time. We had a patient involvement group that said, look, if a trial takes more than a year, uh, you know, people won't want to join. So, uh, so we said one year, and then we said, okay, let's, um, uh, we want to have multiple periods in each one. So of the three types, so then the obvious sort of duration was one month. 
and that meant we could have four blocks of each. Um, so as a result of that, we had to only take people whose symptoms um, uh, consistently have appeared within a week or two of starting. So that they, um, we didn't take people whose symptoms take six months because that's actually a very hard question to answer. And I don't know how well you do a six year trial or something. Um, interestingly though, the people who have six month symptoms, the moment they stop the tablet, it goes away. And uh, so you could do a study where you start real statin and uh, for six months, get the symptom, then stop it. And then placebo for six months and get symptom and stop it and watch the time courses of recovery. Um, and you could do that in a randomized order between statin and placebo and then work, work it out. Um, any kind of systematic protocol of documenting systems, uh, documenting medications and starting and stopping at a pre-specified date rather than only start when you feel really well and only stop when you feel really bad uh, is, is, uh, is better than what we do normally in clinical practice. So most of the advice given by professional societies I think is wrong. Um, far be it from me to say such a thing, but uh, this is well-meaning, but, <laughs> but they do say, you know, all right, you know, well, have, have a bit less, you know, have a bit less or just take it alternative or take it in the evening. You know. All this is doing is encouraging. Well, why would my doctor be saying that to me? if it wasn't actually harmful. If, if it was real, it, it has to be real for them to be trying to reduce the risk that I'm experiencing. I feel the same way about up titration of statin. I don't, I, I start at the top because uh, I see patients who say, oh, my GP, yeah. Oh no, you know, she doesn't know what she's doing. She started the statin and then she gives a bit more and then a bit more, you know, and uh, it's not because she doesn't want to do it. She's just following a protocol of giving 10, 20, 40, 80 or whatever. Uh, and then secondly, it involves all those visits actually happening and resulting in an up titration. And in fact, those visits might not happen. So, so I start the up and then reduce. In fact, I don't reduce uh, <laughs> if possible. <laughs> I actually practice very similar to the way you do. How did the participants in your study who had some anticipation of the outcome related to their symptoms and the statins they were taking react when they saw what they actually experienced and what drugs they were taking at the time? Were they convinced? Did people go back on the medication or did they just walk away? So there was a mixture of results, as you'd expect, because they all had a strong feeling that this was uh, a statin side effect, which is why they'd given up. And yet were curious and happy to um, participate for the greater good, to document things and also to find out for themselves. So by and large, they were surprised, uh, except for the people that had... Um, like many months of tablets that had similar side effects. Yeah. And then they knew there was something funny going on, you know, that maybe just the worst four months were the real, but they weren't that much worse than the less worse months. Um, but by and large, um, uh, they were very uh, interested and glad to be part of the study. And uh, uh, they, as I said, half of them now have gone back to being on uh, a statin. And of the remaining 30, some are saying that they're not gonna be on a statin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some said they just don't want to. Some say, oh, I, I'm feeling too old now, which is perfectly reasonable. It's a way of saying I don't want to, which is fine. Um, and only a small number say, oh, it's because of side effects. I still don't quite accept the results of the trial. And there's a few actually uh, in the UK, um, you know, we have a slightly rationed health care. So I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but. Um, when the, um, uh, because of COVID, where everything becomes enormously complicated, uh, some people haven't been able to go and have a conversation with their GP. Uh, and this is kind of low priority on people's thing because it's they, their primary prevention, it's a statin, it's not urgent that they go back on it. So there's a few more people who are waiting to have that discussion. Or maybe it's a euphemism for saying, actually, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Exactly. But 30, 30 are back on it. <laughs> Daryl, have you, have you thought about any parallels or implications for Samson and Orbita, right? I mean, three, a little over three years ago, you talked to us about Orbita. We learned a great deal about expectations, not only on patient side, but on physician sides of, of outcomes and rigorously testing them. There, there, there's a lot about this study that feels similar to Orbita, although it on the more positive uh, direction. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, yes, there's a, a, a lot uh, that draws from the same well in that we were interested in, um, well, in Orbiter, we got taken in because 
we are everyone on the team thought angioplasty is really good and so it's obvious narrow vessel angina stent it gone they're better everyone knows that in most people it gets better uh, so we were completely stupefied i mean i thought the result of it would be boring apart from any of the the baseline stratified data trying to work out which of the patients had the most benefit um, so that was surprising. Uh, we had a bit of a surprise in this study too, <laughs> I could say. So uh, you'll see when you see the paper that we, we had to change the statistical method. Yeah. Uh, and that was because the original statistical design was by a moron. Uh, and, what, what's uh, the moron's name? Just so I know uh, not well, to no, follow him anymore. Well, when we looked in through, when I said, who came up with this stupid design, which completely messes it up. It was, it turned out to be me. <laughs> and so then I implemented a no blame culture day no, so that day we will have no blame. Anything that happens today, there'll be no blame for it. So we got we got another we got an actual statistician to advise us. So what went wrong was this. In my mind, do you remember that diagram where you have uh, uh, no tablets with low symptoms and lots of tablets? Uh, sorry, and, and statin tablets with high symptoms. And we thought that we'd, those two arms would always look like that, and the thing that would vary would be the placebo arm. On that basis, uh, the anonymous statistician, original statistician's plan was excellent, which is for each patient, you calculate that ratio between the elevation caused by placebo and elevation caused by, by statin. Unfortunately, some people, despite having given up statins for life for side effects, then either had a high baseline symptom or had a low statin symptom uh, and as a result, that number was pretty close to zero. Yeah. And as a result, whatever this number was, uh, completely dominated. It would be, be like a million or minus 3,000. Yeah. So any statistics completely went to crap um, uh, because of those people. Now, we could have left those people out, but when you people start leaving things out from a trial, it's That's a bit suspicious. shifty. Yeah. So um, we found so, that the statistician said, look, let's well, treat everyone as one big pool. And then uh, since those people are few, they won't mess it up. Um, so it, it's an interesting lesson. So it, it's an interesting lesson actually that even though you've given up statins for good for life, uh, when you do it, the only thing different here was it was done under with daily recording of app, of app symptoms. And they discovered that their muscle aches or whatever it is were already there in the background and actually weren't any worse. They just remembered them worse because they were thinking about the statin at the same time, because we are association machines by our nature. Yes. And if there's nothing to associate it with, we don't associate it. Absolutely. So as we approach the end of our chat, so Daryl, are our patients lying or are they crazy? Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a when did you uh, stop beating your wife question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so that's, the, I'm very keen that the uh, Samson results uh, don't get misinterpreted as that. This is not patients making things up. There may be people in the world who make things up, um, but uh, these aren't the patients because they entered a trial to measure this. I think of it like this. So do you like spicy food? Do you like Mexican food, Indian food, uh, uh, Indonesian food? Yeah, so if you go Absolutely. to a restaurant, yeah? Yes. Yeah, you go to a restaurant, you open the menu and you start looking at it. And before you've even like ordered it, you're salivating. And you know, um, uh, you're getting all excited for it, yeah. So are you imagining that saliva? That's the question, yeah? Beautiful. No, it's real saliva. You know, you, it would dribble if you wait long enough. If they take long enough to serve, it will dribble on the table, yeah? And uh, that salivation is not caused by the chemical effect of the food because you haven't eaten it yet. It can't be, but it is a physical thing. It's not an imaginary thing. If you put a pot, you can measure it. You can calculate the mills of it. And that looking at the menu effect is enough to make your body secrete saliva, physical saliva. So how much easier is it for it to do things to your muscle that give you pain, real pain? Uh, it's really there, just like the saliva is really there. So I call it the spicy menu effect. So it's not imagined. You, I mean, you could say you imagine the food, but actually the food is coming. It's the understanding that it's there caused a real saliva. And if you can make liquid come out of your mouth, you can definitely make a few mediators come into your arm that make it very painful. 
Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, we need to somehow break this belief. And it's because we don't talk about it enough and we don't, we think of it as a little bit, uh, but actually it's extremely powerful. In, a, in medical school, we were told that 85% of our therapeutic effect is the placebo effect and only 15% through the medicine. And so people talk to me and say, How, why are you so against the placebo effect in angioplasties? No, I'm not against it. I'm in favor. Let's give maximum placebo. It's, it's like the main thing. Yeah. But when we are studying whether to actually put the bits of metal into people, let's not fall into the homeopathy trap of mixing up the thing we're giving uh, versus the chit chat. So I'm 100% in favor. I'm trying to work with someone on another, another project to try and maximize the placebo effect on purpose separately from maximizing the, um, uh, what, what the stent does. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, we, we've we often should never ask that, we should never allow, we should always um, heckle anyone who talks about uh, lying or pretending or making it up uh, because it's not that, it's a real. It, so it, it, it is real, I mean, people are really experiencing symptoms. It's just that the source of the symptoms are not from the, the chemical statin moiety, they're, they're from a physiologic phenomena in the muscle, in the brain, muscle and brain interaction, et, 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 et cetera. And it's, it's, it's often been said that the best doctors have the best placebos in their, in their toolkit. But again, I, to wrap up then, let's just ask me, discuss one more question, which is, is there a difference here between primary and secondary prevention? You alluded to it before, secondary prevention, our patients already are sick. They're already patients. Um, something has happened to them. Whereas primary prevention, they're, they're not patients really, they're healthy people. And are we turning healthy people into patients by inducing symptoms for something, for the benefit of something that might happen down the line? Yeah, Maybe I think we can that's close a real problem. This discussion. Yeah, no, I don't have um, a proper data on it, but anecdotally, um, I find that the sorts of people that come and argue with you in clinic about statins and their side effects are primary prevention patients. And I suspect it is because there's nothing else wrong with them and they feel perfectly well. And so number one, there is an advantage on being on no tablets at all. It's like being wireless. You know, if you have a wireless laptop, oh, just one wire, you know, into the thing. No, 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 zero. Once you have one wire, it doesn't matter if you have two or three wires. Yeah, you're just tied to a point. But um, uh, so likewise, going from zero to one tablet is very painful. And I'm sure this is the commonest one tablet people are on. Um, you know, uh, worldwide, um, other than maybe the pill, but then you take it for a benefit that you're expecting to realistically expect to get voluntarily asked. So the problem is you go up to someone, as you say, who is completely healthy as far as they're concerned and force them to start having a tablet and believing they have um, uh, a condition which they don't agree to have, don't want to have. Um, in contrast, in the people who've had a heart attack, um, they... Uh, are given lots of things at the same time and probably not much psychological focus on statins and their side effects. So once you come in with a myocardial infarction, our staff, I mean, I personally won't explain to you about the statin. Um, we'll put the stent in, but then when they go up to the ward, it will be somebody else uh, who will just quickly go through the tablets and the patient will just nod and not really pay attention. I mean, nobody really cares. They knew they were really ill. They feel better now. They just want to get out of this place alive. Um, uh, and they, 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 you know, you can explain at depth what it all is. And uh, you know that when they go and tell their wife at home, so, you know, what, what is it? Oh, yeah, these are tablets. I've got to take these, the doctor says. And this is for one year. And then the rest of them are for life. And they go, that seems a lot. Yeah, that seems a lot. And then they may come back to me and say, this is a lot of tablets. Can I stop some? but they don't come with a detailed plan of, you know, this causes this and this causes that. They don't have that ability to differentiate them because they're all started together. So I suspect with the secondary, number one, they already feel ill and they feel that they're getting benefit from medicine as a whole. Um, uh, but also they haven't had a, a massively focused chit chat on one tablet being started. So that's two advantages for them. And I suspect that's why I'm not seeing them, them so often in the, um, you know, statin side effect uh, population. Great. Daryl, I really appreciate you taking the time this morning. It's going to be a very busy weekend for you. It's already started. Uh, looking forward to seeing this in, in print and uh, to your next research adventure. I'm especially looking forward to seeing what the Twitter sphere has to say about this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Me too. Thank Thanks you very again, much. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye.